Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. Stephen, good to see you. Good to see you, George. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and um, just uh, share with you some of the trends that we're seeing um, uh, across the various verticals and industries that we service. I know it's an education event, and we'll try to focus in on some of those things, but um, I wanted to kind of, at least we wanted to give you a view of the larger market, uh, some things that you may be already plugged into, but uh, things to kind of look forward to. Um, and I want to thank LinkedIn for this opportunity. So um, digital media trends that we're seeing. Um, you know, the, the state of marketing is that, as you know, and it's nothing uh, that's not um, you know, well discussed, there are so many touch points especially for us who are in the business of measuring and helping advise clients and brands and uh, end, end customers or end users, like um, education uh, institutions, there, there are lots of touch points. And there's no single path to purchase anymore. Stevens will talk, talk to more about the consumer path to purchase, but it was a simpler time uh, even just a few years ago, and there's no single path to purchase. Um, but we, we want to give you some insights today as to how this is evolving. And it's difficult to quantify impact. Um, there is no shortage of channels and no shortage of touch points where you can reach your target audience. Um, and so from our perspective, uh, one important starting point is to ask the right questions. Um, and data can inform or help inform the answers to a lot of these questions. And the answers will change over time. It's not a uh, static answer. And so I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna present some examples um, that will give you an idea of how we use data to ask the right questions and to get some answers for a particular execution. Um, and LinkedIn is as good a platform or better platform than, than most in reaching the right audience and having a collaborative approach with uh, a platform owner to reach the audience that you want to speak to. Questions we try to answer, and we've, you know, we try to bucket things. There's so many points of interest, so many points of data on uh, consumer, on media, on engagement. We try to bucket things in our company into divisions that um, can work together or work individually depending on what the client needs are. Um, so some of, the right some of the questions that we think are, uh, should, people should be asking is, you know, what's the consumer's media journey? And some of that will be touched on later. Um, you know, what's the relevant creative message? The order of these things um, I'll touch on, but it can vary depending on your situation. And what's working as far as creative messaging? And it's not just about banner ads or a video ad. It's about the journey. And, uh, the content, we don't see that necessarily advertising, it's content and what's working, what's not. Who is the target audience and how do you formulate that? Is it just based on demos and gender as we've had in the past or is there, are there other scalable classifications that, that work? Um, where did the ad appear or where did the communication appear? Um, that's important to know that it's a journey and what you want to say next depends upon uh, where uh, you previously reach this, uh, the consumer. Um, how much time was spent? Who saw the message? What did they do about it? That's a, that's a huge one for us. You know, in the day of, of digital, in the age of digital that we're in, you have to know what happened after. And so we call that earned media intelligence, uh, but it can be also purchase data, which kind of tells you, you know, what happened after. So, so those are some of the questions that we're asking. Um, and while we could focus on any number of th things in the time allotted to me, I wanted to kind of start on uh, audiences and how to figure out um, how to target audiences uh, with communications, with content that's relevant to them. And I'm going to use some. Uh, I'm going to present some use cases that may be helpful. Hopefully, uh, give you some thoughts about how to manage um, your own business and uh, how to get communications to the people that are relevant uh, to you. So this is a use case that we had of um, you know, reaching a intended audience online. And the client was, uh, was, was presented with this situation, a ch this challenge. A TV provider was looking to target existing customers 
uh, with an offer promoting the ability to watch different channels in different rooms and different services. So a product evolution that they wanted to present to a very relevant custom, a very relevant audience, which is their customers, right? And so um, in, it's appropriate that we're talking about this here, because LinkedIn happens to be one of the platforms where um, you can really leverage the in amount of information that the platform has about consumers, about users, about people, to be very targeted about, who, about the, people, uh, the people that you reach. In this case, you wanted to reach a customer as opposed to the audience at large. And it wasn't necessarily, uh, the client was not le looking for uh, a deduction. They wanted to know that it was actual customer. And what we did was create an audience of existing subscribers who watched TV across multiple devices. Um, we refined the target by including those who uh, definitive, de definitely agreed that um, you know, technology has changed and they're watching, um, watching TV across, across platforms. Um, of course, we are in the business of analytics and measurement and research, so uh, we always do after the fact to understand, you know, did it work, did it not work? And in this case, uh, the target segment was um, identified as 33% longer, spending longer uh, than the campaign average. And so this was a, you know, a, a case of using um, data, the information that we have about uh, usage, about uh, the client's customers to reach, the, reach them in another platform. Um, just to give you an idea of how that worked, um, again, these may be things that you're very familiar with already. Okay, it went a little too fast. Uh, okay, this may be things you're already familiar with, but what we did was uh, identify uh, panelists using a large panel that we have. Um, our business uh, historically has been a panel business, and we still maintain huge panels, bigger panels than uh, most in the industry when you, con when you consider our own and the partnership that we have. Uh, and we identified the client's own customer, customer base within that panel. Um, and then uh, used uh, look-alike targeting, um, working with the middle layer of uh, the advertising ecosystem, uh, who are you know uh, who are able to bring in various data points to um, uh, align the customer, the client's customer, with others who are in the same in the same domain, and then we were able to reach them online using cookies. Um, just another example that I want to cite, you know, was um, ad targeting. An advertiser was looking to conquest. In this case, it was not about reaching its own customer. It was about uh, conquesting or conquering the competition's customers. And, you know, the same mechanism that's deployed uh, to reach your own customer, you can, you can reach um, uh, your competition's customers. And so this is a, a very effective campaign that we, were, that we helped with, um, and we used real-time ad occurrences. Um, you know, the uh, most of, a, a lot of what we do now takes into context not just one platform, but, you know, cross-platform. So in this use case, we used TV, uh, we used real-time TV ads database to um, sync uh, targeting online uh, based on the presumed exposure to the competitor's advertising on, 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 within TV. So syncing up the two platforms to better sync the messaging or better conquest uh, the, the uh, customers of the, comp of the competition. Again, a diagram just to kind of show you how that worked. You know, the key is to have pieces in place and to have thought about what you want to do. Um, if you want to respond, then you need to have an idea of advertising as it comes in, and you need to have a database of ads that's captured real time. And you need to have the relationships in place in order to um, have the intelligence to know, you know who was exposed to that, whether you want to reach that person or not, is it wasted inventory or not, to try to reach that person. So these are some of the things that we're doing already. Uh, one last uh, example I'll show of uh, using you know, cross-platform targeting is share of voice targeting. In this case, an advertiser was looking to cam combat against brand clutter. You know, there's so many voices uh, that come across people uh, like us and consumers as we navigate media channels. Um, you, our historic uh, database and historic study uh, normative uh, information tell us, 
if, you know, if, if the, tell us the lift you can achieve by being a single voice uh, in a clean room, in a clear room, or by countering or being in a, in a place where there's lots of voices, but if you are not there also, you're at a, you're at a disadvantage. Those kind of, uh, that kind of research is very, very helpful. And in this case, we used um, uh, that information to reach uh, websites for the client, which was an auto, uh, auto client, to reach client opportunity zones that would moderate clutter, high clutter, zero clutter, very high clutter, low clutter, and clutter is defined by the client's own product and brand or the category or whatever, whatever metric you want to use to identify, to uh, isolate clutter. Um, and then you know, decide uh, based, on your, uh, based on the information and the research that your partner have or you have about how you want to, how you want to reach a high value target. Um, I could go on uh, with that, you know, with a lot of use cases that kind of show you how to work across media, um, how uh, consumers can be reached with very targeted messaging, knowing exactly what they were exposed to previously, knowing exactly what their journey, journey uh, was. But I'll, I'll let Stephen speak to more about um, uh, how, how we kind of go about understanding the consumer journey, journey and explaining that to the marketplace. Thank you. Okay, yeah. I'm going to walk around a little bit. Um, so I'm Stephen DeMarco. I'm the head of Miller Brown Digital. And I still get jitters when I do this. So when I get jitters, I, I tend to get a little cheeky and use some humor to calm myself down. <laughs> I'll look at Saeed if he goes, tch, 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 tch. I don't know if I've crossed the line. The first thing I want to do, because I think you left us with plenty of time, is I want to have the, uh, the announcer in the back of the room say your name and my name. Because it sounded really cool. Yeah. When you did Saeed's name. So can you give us a George Papachan? Uh-oh. <laughs> Let's see. George. Oh, oh you got it that's right. good. That's good. That's pretty good. Pretty good. I'm How about a Stephen DeMarco? <laughs> Stephen DeMarco. <Ooh. laughs> so, oh, wow. I'm not sure about that one. Ooh, it's like the All right. Or yeah. Sound like a male prostitute. <laughs> uh, so, by now, you may have been looking at my LinkedIn profile too, and you'll see that I, before I came to uh, the WPP family, I worked at Comedy Central. So I do have some comedy in my blood, and I use it freely. Um, so, and also, I have my phone in my front pocket, and so if I see you guys on your phone during my presentation, my assumption is that you are not only checking out my LinkedIn profile, but sending me messages. So the, the number of times it vibrates will be how good my presentation is. And if, I don't, if I see you on the phone and I don't get any vibrations, I know that I'm screwed. <laughs> So we're going to talk about two things. Uh, George did a great presentation on targeting, and I think it's a really interesting topic, um, a ton of innovation. When we talk to our clients who are a combination of advertisers, agencies, and media companies, everybody's focusing on shifting from kind of more content-centric advertising to audience-centric advertising. So thinking about moving from a property-based media plan to an audience-based media plan, rather than using property as a proxy or demographics as a proxy, use the actual audience data. And I think LinkedIn's a great example of that, both um, as a destination site, but also as a platform, data that can be used off of the platform. It's really fascinating. So George, thank you for the primer on targeting. I'm gonna talk about the uh, consumer journey, otherwise known as the path to purchase, and then talk a little bit at the end about measurement, and then George is gonna wrap it all up into uh, one nice big present. So, um, this is always a, like a little test that I do when I talk about the path to purchase of the consumer journey. Um, so raise your hand if you think you've got 10% visibility into your, I guess we'll call it applicants, path to purchase, path to enrollment. 10% visibility, be brave, raise your hand. 20%, 30%, 40%, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100%. So less than 10%. It seems like 95% of the room has less than 10% visibility into their applicant's path to purchase. That's huge. That means that there's a lot of marketing going on without a lot of insight, which is a great way to waste a lot of money, which you don't want to do because you don't have a lot of it. There's not an endless supply of money. Um, so that's why path to purchase is important. And if you can really master the path to purchase in your marketing, then you can really make those marketing dollars work for you and achieve your business goals. So we do a lot of that for, um, for our clients. I think 
the first step that, that, that companies often do or marketers often do when they think about the path to purchase is really focused on the tail end of it, which is the funnel, because uh, that's really kind of the easiest place to optimize. You've already got the person on your website. But you just want to make sure that you get them through into an application. Uh, and there's still a lot of optimization that, be, that can be done there. Um, with our clients, though, who have typically mastered that, you know, these are companies who are spending tens of millions of dollars on software to optimize the tail end of, of the purchase journey, um, they're really starting to go more holistic. And so they're looking further, further, and further back into the consideration process, going very broad uh, and very deep, and trying to get as many people through the early stages of the funnel, mid stages of the funnel, all the way to the end. And that takes a lot of data and a lot of research, which is exciting because there's a lot of insights that can be drawn there. Um, but I think ultimately what marketers are trying to come up with is, you know, we like to think of it as like a marketing operating system for, your, for their business. Think of an operating system for a computer, pulls all the different parts together, and makes it easy most of the time to get stuff done. There's an opportunity to do that with marketing beyond just the tail end of the funnel to go way back and say, how do we build an overall marketing operating system that pulls together our media, our actual programs in and of itself, you know, the, the consumer experience of, of joining, enrolling in, a, in an institution, um, all of that um, through into one cohesive experience that we know with all the dials we can optimize. So we're going to talk a little bit about that right now. <clears throat> there are probably 50 frameworks for displaying what the path to purchase looked like. It used to be a funnel. Right, then people got really creative and they turned it into a circle. And then they got really creative and they turned it into a circle with another circle overlapping it. And then it's all trying to describe the sequence of the purchase. And yes, there's, you know, simple, there's a sequence. There's a beginning and there's an end. But what happens in between is like this crazy display that it takes like a data visualization package to um, show and all it looks like is a lot of squiggly lines. Because that's what a consumer goes through as they're trying to figure out what the hell they want to do, regardless of what industry that they're in. Um, so we'd like to break it down into two things that you really need to know. You don't need to worry about what it looks like, because no framework actually can ever capture that. You just really need to know what you need to know. The first thing is as much as you can about the consumer segment. What are their demographics? Where are they based? And what are their psychographics? And the psychographics get really interesting now because you have a lot of interesting behavioral data or other data that you can append to their demographics. Age, income, gender, not nearly enough to do anything useful with with, but you start to get into some of the LinkedIn profile data, you get into other online behavioral activity, um, you're starting to develop really rich profiles of, of consumers. So once you understand your segments, which there will be multiple segments, not just one segment, then you can really dig into what's the relationship. And for us, it happens increasingly online because online is a place to do a lot of research. What's the relationship with the category? And what's the relationship with the brand? What's the relationship with the different um, channel touch points? And I'll go through each one of those now. From a category perspective, it's really understanding how are they interacting with the education category as a whole. There's a number of different aspects of higher education. Financial aid, selecting a school, selecting a program, all of that stuff, so on down the line. And you need to understand how consumers are interacting with that as they're making their purchase decision. How big is the category, right? People probably don't even know how big the higher education category is online. We do. Second thing is the brand. Typically, your institution, what do those brand touch points look like as people go in deeper into the funnel? Not only your brand, but rival brands. What's the interaction between, or what's the difference between an interaction that a consumer is having with your institution versus another institution, and what, what influences are each having on each other. And then ultimately, it's the touch points, the channel touch points that we focus on, which is it could be a shopping channel, it could be a media channel, it could be a device. If you can just master those, those things, which is probably complicated in and of itself, you can really start to make some headway in understanding the path to purchase. Once you understand it, then you can operate on it. So I've got a couple data slides here, because we are a data and insights company, oh, yeah. so I have to, I have to do it. <clears throat> One thing that we look at is um, how the category influences the length of the path to purchase and frequently the actual um, number of days that someone spends in the purchase funnel. So this is an example of different categories that we look at. From the left-hand side, it's low involvement categories, and all the way up to the right-hand side 
is the highest involvement category. So it's 48 days for online research for automotive and 4.3 days for alcohol, which I'm assuming is wine. I, I'm like 30 minutes when I buy wine. <laughs> like one touch. <laughs> so um, I think this is interesting because you really do see a progression of length. And when you see a progression of length, that means that there's a progression of marketing opportunities mm -hmm. um, to interject and place yourself within that purchase journey and start to influence people to your, to your site or to your institution versus others. So we know what the length is for, at least for, for MBAs and for graduate programs. Anybody want to take a guess what it is, where it would fall? Two days now. You can't guess. You already know. Two years. What's that? 18 to 24 months. So that's incredible. You know, it differs depending on the type of program that you're enrolling in. But for master's programs, it's 18 to 24 months. So that puts, that puts this, most of this group way far out on the left-hand side. Of, of the slide. And we also know that early on, people make, uh, form a consideration set of about three institutions that early on. So that means you've got a, um, you know, a very short window to get into that consideration set if you want to be the primary, one of the primary institutions. And then you've got 18 to 24 months to defend your turf from everybody else, as well as steal someone else's share if you're not in that consideration set. And that's where the role of media and particularly content marketing comes in. Make sense? Um, another thing that we look at is devices. So we are living in a cross-media, cross-platform, cross-channel, cross-device world. I mean, everything that we talk about with our clients now is, begins with the word cross. And it makes measurement really challenging, um, but it makes discovery really exciting when you come up with a new insight that someone can apply. And so this chart looks at um, device usage, like d device preference based on the task length at hand. And so this is a consumer task length at hand. You can see that smartphones are used to the top line, top red line, used for short bursts of tasks. You know, when you're standing in a bank line and you want to go check a sports score, you just want to get a quick hit, you want to poke somebody, smartphone is the way to do it. When it gets towards things like applications and some more um, intense interactions where you're going to be entering information or really digging deep, then consumers will go to a PC. So this has huge implications, and the tablets kind of fit somewhere in between. Um, we also have information on the difference between browser usage and app usage as it relates to tasks. That's interesting. We found that um, people perform, people use mobile browsers to perform the same tasks they would typically use a PC for. And then people use apps for things that are more kind of relationship extenders. So if I'm already enrolled at an institution, I'll download the app and use, the use that app. But if I'm thinking about enrolling, why would I ever download an app, right? I'm not even a member of it yet. So you got to think about how you're going to invest your dollars there. But this is important because you start to think about how we start to plan out our touch points. If I've got a dollar to spend and I need to make an, an improvement to the application process to make sure that I convert more people at the bottom of the funnel, should I spend it on the mobile browser app or should I spend it on the PC? So of course I'm going to spend it on the PC. But as it relates to content marketing, you really have a tough decision. Um, if I were thinking about content marketing and I realized that a large amount of the millennial segment is, you know, lives on their mobile devices, then I would think about mobile-centric content marketing at the early, early, early stages of the consideration set and make it really work on a, in a mobile context, which I think LinkedIn is fantastic at. So again, you've got to make marketing decisions based on the task that you think that your customer or your future customer is going to be enrolled in as it relates to which device you want to optimize for. This is what we call the size of the prize slide. And so what we've done is we have a like George was talking about, a panel of consumers uh, in the United States, about 2 million people big. So it's, it's the largest panel in the industry. And we track their daily online activity across everything that they do online, which websites they go to, which web pages they visit, which search terms they use, 
which products they buy, um, which companies they're customers of, because a lot of people log into online sites for banking, financial services, et cetera. So we've got a really broad view of our consumers' daily lives online, which is a great reflection of their entire life. And so we can categorize all of this activity into which industries do consumers interact with the most. And when I asked my team to pull the data, this is a quarterly visitation to these categories, I was amazed how big, at first, the higher education category was. I expected it to be relatively smaller compared to things like banking. Everybody interacts with banking. Everybody's got a bank account. Everybody's got a credit card. And then when I saw that higher education was as large as one of the largest industries online, I said, holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow, uh, there's a lot, the size of the prize is big, there's a lot of money to be made here, um, and there's a lot of, also a lot of marketing that needs to be conducted here. If you think about the difference between the, cat the higher education category and then all of the other classic categories like my cell phone, my car, my bank, and my TV, um, those are all pretty concentrated industries. So if you think about the banking industry, it's a very large industry, but your options to, uh, for a consumer bank are pretty limited to the banks that are in your region. You know, there might be five or six. Um, your options for a credit card are limited to four or five. Even um, for a wireless carrier, you know, if that whole category is based on four wireless companies battling each other for a limited pie. It just doesn't grow. You look at the higher education market, it's literally hundreds if not thousands of providers who are vying for each other, super fragmented market. And it means to me, my interpretation is, it's a whole lot easier to pick up market share in that kind of space because you can spend a little money and pick it up from a couple of different providers or a couple of different rivals versus having to steal a, com a customer from AT&T or versus stealing a customer for Bank of America. It's a really, really exciting time, I think, for higher education marketers. And for those who can figure it out, because there are thousands of them, and there are about 200 people in this room, you're going to have a leg up over everybody else if you can start to put in practice some of these programs that we're talking about today. Because the other couple hundred thousand <laughs> are missing out. So this is good. This is a good thing. All right. Sorry, I'm going to skip that slide. Other than say that um, I'm from Boston. And uh, New Massachusetts and California are neck and neck here Over index, yeah. uh, on who has the most populated websites. So what we want to now talk about is, well, that wasn't a very good slide, I'm sorry. There was a reason, but we're running out of time. So that's the customer journey. Um, customer journey, when you do customer journey research, it's the kind of research that you do once every two or three years. Um, it's foundational research, it's very useful research, and it's the kind of research that can, you can leverage throughout your communications program, and it's the kind of research that you can use to get budget dollars from the institution, whoever controls the budget dollars. Um, it becomes facts and data um, rather than um, intuition-based you know, budgeting and forecasting. So it's very, very, very valuable research. What I'm talking about now is optimizing through better measurement. Measurement is not sexy. You know, usually people start to lift up their phone or some people leave the room, grab a coffee, because we're going to talk about data and measurement, and it's a boring topic. But I am here to make you guys sexy through better measurement, through better data. <laughs> You're going to be as sexy as George oh. Hapachen. Wow, high bar. <laughs> high bar, OK. <laughs> um, so I think the trick is, when you think about measurement, it's grounded in insights, but insights aren't really worth anything unless you apply those insights. And my team is in the business of meeting with large brands, large advertiser agencies, large publishers, and we get really excited about finding the world's like, most searing insight, and then we give it to them via PowerPoint slide, mm -hmm. high-five each other, and then we run out the door. And then the client says, well, to get paid. What, or what do I do next? <laughs> right? Like, what do I do next with this insight? I don't know what to do with it. Um, it's a great piece of information, but I don't know what to do next. And I think that's if you're doing research and if you're using measurement, if you're using any kind of data, no matter where you're getting from, you have to remind the provider that it has to do one of two things. It has to measurably improve an existing business process that you're already engaged in, or it has to create a new business process that's measurably be better than the one before. 
And any piece of data, any piece of insight, any piece of advice that you get that doesn't do that, you just don't have time to deal with. So measurably improve an existing process or create a new one. That is a philosophy that we live by. So how do we make measurement sexy? Um, there are a lot of presentations, a lot of views on big data. And big data is one of these amorphous things that scares a lot of people because it's big and I don't know how to apply it and I don't know what to do with it and it sounds like a job that should be somebody else's job. I'm a marketer, I don't want to be an IT person. So again, we try and simplify things down to a framework that's actionable and that we've uh, developed over time. For us, in the marketing process, in the media measurement process, in the optimization process, it's about the ABCs. So if you can think about audience, brand, consumer behavior, and sales, and measure across all four of those in a continuous way with a common data set, you can start to build a marketing operating system that I was talking about at the beginning of the session. So I'm going to go through each of those um, quickly. But audience talks about reach. I think that's a lot of what, what George focused on in the beginning. Yep. How many people in my target audience am I hitting with my content, with how much uh, frequency, and is it the, the latest uh, industry um, topic, is, is the actual content viewable, whether it's a piece of paid media is a really big th thing. So I don't want to pay for impressions that my audience doesn't see. So it's all, reach is all about efficiency. The more efficient you are, the less you can spend to reach the same amount of people, or you can even spend more money and reach more people. Efficiency argument. The, the latter three are measures of effectiveness or impact. So on the brand side, what we do is a lot of analysis that, that compares a control segment of people who don't, are not exposed to the content or the ad to people who do, and try and some, so show some measure of lift or improvement. So is this pretty standard stuff that you guys know about, or is it kind of... Pretty new? Okay, good. So one measure of, of effectiveness is very, very upper funnel brand lift. So for someone who's exposed to my campaign, do they have a more favorable impression of my brand? Are they now, depending on, on the industry, are they even aware of me compared to the um, control segment? Do they have a favorable impression of me compared to the uh, control segment? And are they more likely to engage with me somehow because of that? And that's done through a survey. The next thing is consumer behavior impact. Using the same control versus exposed, um, are people who have exposed to my media more likely to do something in a behavioral context? Visit my website, look at, um, perform a branded search, look at content in my category, like am I, because people are seeing my content, am I actually motivating to go do something that's taking the next step in the purchase journey? This is cutting edge, brand new stuff. Um, a lot of companies can figure out how to measure click-through rates on their media, don't use that as a metric. Some, some companies use view through, which is somebody who's exposed to my ad, did they come to my website within a 30 day, 45 day window? That's better, you can use that. But it's really understanding, we talked about how big the higher education category is. Are you driving people into the category, at least, to getting them to the first step? So that's, that's where consumer behavior impact comes in. And the last one is sales outcomes. So it's sales, purchase, application, whatever it is. For the audience that was exposed to my ad, did they actually do the end behavior that I want? And the trick, like I said, is to be able to understand that in one consistent um, context, so you're not using one partner to do one thing, another partner to do another thing, using a homegrown system to do the other thing, and then when you try and integrate it all together, it doesn't work, because it's all based on different audience definitions and things like that. So here I will use the funnel, and you think about it is, it follows the ABC. So the top end of the funnel is audience effect, all about um, audience reach. And the next few slides follow this format, so I was going to do us all a favor and just kind of frame the slide for you. So on the left hand of the slide is where the data comes in for the sexy data geeks. And there's three components starting at the top. There's the performance of the campaign versus some benchmark. There's the formula which shows the outcome or the lift. And then there's the dollar return at the bottom. And so in this case, the, there was a campaign, we just, this is a um, kind of like sanitized data, but it's $100,000 worth of media spent. And the targeting efficiency, um, because we used a, a better audience definition than the client had prior, prior used, um, was a 2.5% lift for one site and a 5% lift 
for the whole campaign. So because of the more efficient audience definitions, more, the better, sharper, uh, more targeted targeting rules, we were able to get a 5% lift um, over the prior campaign. And if you look at that, the box to the right shows that we were able to reach out of the total audience of 3.8 million consumers, uh, 2 million consumers with the, with the campaign. So we reached 2 million consumers in our market. The cost per consumer, because it was $100,000 spend, was five, ten, 5 cents per target consumer. And then the inverse of that is the target consumers per dollar spent, which is $19, I'm uh, sorry, 19 consumers per dollar spent in my media. So you're starting to get a sense of the audience. What you want to be able to do is continue to tweak, from the audience perspective, your media mix. So it's your site plan, your media partners, your content marketing strategy, um, whether the media mix is all digital or part TV or part print. You want to continue to tweak these things so you can continue to drive your, um, your metrics up in terms of numbers of consumers reached for dollar spent. Mm -hmm. Then we get into brand. Here we're looking at, again, impact. And here um, there is a 7.4% lift in um, what we call a brand metric, whatever that brand metric was, is awareness here, um, for people who are in the control group to the exposed group. So if you were, in the, if you were exposed to the ad, you were 7.4% more likely to have a positive impression of the brand or be more aware of the brand compared to people who didn't see the ad. That's great. Through, through the same formula, what's the performance? That means you were able to influence 282,000 people to become more aware of the brand. That cost you 37 cents per consumer, and you're able to drive higher brand awareness with, for 2.7 people. I don't know what 0.7 a person is, but 2.7 people per dollar spent on the, on the same media. Right? So you're starting to now build kind of like a layered cake story around reach and impact. We continue to flow through this, and now we're looking at branded visitation. So branded visitation is someone who saw the ad actually went and interacted with the brand, whether the brand, whether it was the website or the social media channel that the brand participates in. So the LinkedIn page for your institution or the Facebook page for your institution, anything that that might be. And so control versus exposed is a 13% lift, which translates into 458,000 people performed the, the, the kind of the behavioral activity that you were looking for, which means 23 cents per target consumer, and then four, four consumers or so did that. And then ultimately we drive it through to sales and this is where, um, this is the hardest part from a measurement perspective because it's hard to get the data. Um, but when we do, it's like this is where the big ROI is from. So there's a 0.4% lift in sales. That means that 15,294 people who saw the ad actually wound up purchasing the item. It was a $50 item. And so it's $6.90 per consumer and 14 cents, per, uh, sorry, 14.14 consumers per dollar spent. <laughs> hard. That's a lot of stuff, right? Who's feeling sexy right now? Yeah. This is where it feels sexy. So when you're able to integrate it all into one dashboard, one marketing operating system, you can really understand how to optimize your media campaigns. And your media campaign could be a function of um, your targeting efficiency. It could be a function of which, which is basically which the media that you place and the mix that you use. You get into some of the impact measures, then you're starting to get into things like, not only am I, am I working with the right marketing partners, um, and, but am I placing the media in, in the right spot of the funnel? Are my touch points, at, do, they, do they map to the consumer journey? Also, are my touch points engaging? Like, I think one of the first questions that you asked was, do I have the right creative, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a lot to figure out within this, but a very simple framework around the ABCs allows you to look broad and deep into the efficiency and the effectiveness of your marketing. And if you start to do this on a regular basis, I mean, we have clients who optimize on a daily basis. Most of our clients optimize on a monthly basis because it's, it's just too, too much. They can't, they can't move their marketing. Like they can't, their processes don't move fast enough. Um, but on a monthly basis, if you can look and say, what part of the funnels do I, do I need to improve and how can I do it? You really get into an iterative process where you can, for the same amount of marketing spend, get more through the funnel. Make sense? And then you can actually see the interplay between targeting and efficiency, awareness, 
brand visits, and penetration. If you do it all on one common data set, then you can cross-tab these things with each other. And then you get really geeky. I mean, you have to go to your like, stats department or your econometrics teams to do that for you. Um, but it's great because all of a sudden you have one common data set organized in a simple framework that begin to make it easier to dial up or down, dial down the knobs that you know make a difference in your business. So with that, I'm going to hand it to, to George to wrap up. And uh, you've inspired me. I'm going to stand up. Also, it's better to you know, read off of this. So, yeah, I, I think what Stephen um, mentioned about you know, being very methodical about your approach um, as you move from the top of the funnel down and using data points not just as a, a point in time, but being able to appreciate uh, the movement over time. Um, I think that's where you get to really show the ROI um, from the work that you're doing. And so if I were to just put some takeaways together, I guess the overarching theme is that uh, data-driven uh, marketing is key to achieve measurable outcomes. Um, if you want to move beyond uh, the um, instincts and you want to be able to identify uh, how you've done better or worse uh, with your marketing budget and limited resources, um, data-driven marketing is important because if marketing activities are not measured, then the continuous learning and improvement loop is not engaged. Now, you know, Miller Brown Digital and, Mark and Miller Brown has a, a normative data set that I used to play around in my early days with just to understand, you know, for what categories move greatly versus other categories and um, what are the brands, you know, certain periods of time, certain creatives tend to do better and they have less impact over time um, because the novelty factor is worn off. And those are all things that you learn um, as you use data more regularly and you appreciate the trends in the data. Um, so three specific takeaways, reach your audience uh, across media channels. Um, you know, leverage time-tested proven concepts like a message recency uh, uh, relative to an activation that, that you're expecting or message frequency and also the competitive context uh, to get more out of your investments. Um, like Steven said, it, it, it kind of is a zero-sum game. I mean, the media channels are, are exponentially increasing, but when you, talk, when, you wanna, uh, when you talk about return on your investment, there is a, a, a share game that is in play. And so you want to understand the competitive context. And I showed one example of the clutter versus the not clutter. Those are things that can kind of go to the competitive context and give you a chance to speak or to present yourself uh, without, the, um, without the confusion of comp competing messages. Um, then consumers, sorry about that. Okay, uh, consumers should be at the center of planning. Uh, the moments, and we've talked to the consumer journey a little bit here, but it's so detailed. I remember, remember in the early days of uh, Miller Brown Digital Compete, the consumer journey graph, and it had all of these lines, and there's, you know, there's like four or five or six kind of, um, if you were to piece it all together, that give you scale, but it's so much more complicated now and it's so, mo so much more specific to uh, not just the category, but also the, uh, the, the brand positioning within that category. So the consumer should be at the center of the planning, the moments and places in their journey where they are open to listen. Uh, you know, a two-year uh, consideration cycle, that's a lot of opportunity to speak. I mean, there's also a lot of opportunity for all of that to be conquested by somebody else, but still a two-year cycle. There are moments and places in their journey where they're open to listening and seeking out information, um, as you know. And there are also signals from our data set uh, where a decision is near. And it may be from uh, a, a, the category or the industry that we've looked at very deeply to draw out from across those clients where, um, where, the, where the decision point is nearing. So you know, with, with all of these uh, points, whether it's seeking out information, whether they're in a posture of listening, whether they're in a posture of about to make a decision, if you put consumer at the center of your planning, it'll make a difference with your investment. Uh, and finally, good advertising works. Um, I mean, I think uh, if you're in the industry, you've heard it said that um, 
the question is about you know what of your investment works versus what doesn't work. You know it works, but you know which is the wasted and which is uh, the useful. But it's well worth the effort to test uh, iteratively and know what resonates with your target audience, particularly around creative messaging. Uh, we were, you know, there's clients now that are using um, creative uh, occurrences at scale to quickly pull out, to quickly replace, to quickly supplement. And so um, what res resonates with your target audience? And if it's working, you'll know by the engagement and activation indicators that you measure over time. We had a, a, a recent study where we did, and one of the, of course, path to purchase, of course, engagement on social media is what we do, but we also tested um, foot traffic to, and it, it's not in the education category, but I can imagine a scenario where you can add, add, add additional engagement metrics as a, a point in time to appreciate um, trends and to appreciate how you're moving someone from interested to including you in the consideration set to potentially becoming um, becoming loyal to you. And with that, I'll stop. <laughs>